Good afternoon. How's everybody today? Good, good. Can't complain. Can't complain. Not with weather like this, anyway. I'm going to start with, I'm going to go back to last week real quick here. Someone brought up the question, I believe it was you, about the, what was the first Reich? Yes, well we know the Third Reich was what? Hitler's Germany, the Second Reich was Bismarck's Germany, and the first one really was the Holy Roman Empire. And if you remember, I had that brain freeze. Who, start, who really starts the Holy Roman Empire? Charlemagne, 800 AD. And then it morphs into what's gonna be known as the Holy Roman Empire, but Mr. Napoleon will kill that in 1805 at the Battle of Austerlitz and then the Treaty of Pressburg and then follow, the following years it's all busted up until Mr. Napoleon puts together the Confederation of the Rhine and then you begin to get this semblance of a modern Germany that we went into last week. This week the Munich Putsch. Hitler attempts to take power by force. However before we really get into that it might be a good idea, you know, if you take a look at that handout, which is a bit voluminous here, you know, this idea of the swastika, remember that one? Yeah, you know, the swastika wasn't just being used by the Germans. If you go into halfway through that handout, I found, and I thought it'd be interesting just to throw this in here, in England, during World War I, the War Savings Association, affiliated to the National War Savings, or War Savings Committee. Look what's in the middle of that page. Swastika. That yeah, comes out of India, which the uh, you know the the. In, so, in fact, if in fact I in my records at home on aviation history, I've got some pictures of German warplanes from the First World War with swastikas on them. Remember one guy in particular had a almost a powder powder blue on his plane and there's a swastika, rounded swastika, but there's a swastika on his plane. So this emblem that's be with the Nazi party is actually gaining credence even before the collapse of Imperial Germany. Interesting what you see here. It's fascinating. The other side of the coin here is uh, this idea of uh, fascism. Now again, if, if you take a look at the first two pages and then go to, again, the, the pages three and four, uh, you see here the program of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which is interesting reading here. But again, going back to pages one and two, the idea of fascism, well, Mussolini, fascist Italy? Isn't that considered the first real fascist state? Yeah, of course it is. But then again, what the heck is fascism? What is it? Hasn't that been accorded to the current occupant of the Oval Office in some quarters? Yeah, it has been. Uh, but here you see, it's interesting. Fascism contains the elements of nationalism, syndicalism. Uh, the, there's an end note to that, and it's on page two. Uh, oh, idealism, republicanism. Fascism hinges on the idea of the primacy of the state. That's a fascist state. Obedience, discipline. These factors are determinants of the cultural, societal, political, and moral philosophies which will emerge from such a state. The state manages a firm grip on all endeavors. Fascism can actually be authoritarian or totalitarian. And the poster child expression of fascism was Mussolini's Italy. And in a corporate fascist state, an underpinning of Il Duce's dictatorship was a primacy of the state. And this is actually what Mussolini states in, 1930, in June of 1932. It is anti-individualistic. The fascist conception of life stresses the importance of the state and accepts the individual only insofar as his interests coincide with those of the state. What happened to this freedom of the individual? <clears throat> That's gone. And if liberty, now this is interesting, and if liberty is to be the attribute of living men and not of abstract dummies invented by individualistic liberalism, then fascism stands as the only liberty worth having. 
the liberty of the state and the individual within the state. The fascist conception of the state is all-embracing. Outside of it, no human or spiritual values can exist, much less have value. So this, you're getting the impression that modes of human, in, in human decency and civil conduct do not need to apply. You can come to that conclusion. Go back to what I mentioned last week to some of these old these, these 19th century philosophers of a Germanic persuasion like Johann Gottlieb Fichte, the Latin races, uh, they're dregs of society. The inveterate Jew is a pollutant to the, to, to the, to the, <laughs> to the to race. It's interesting what you're seeing develop here out of the 19th century going into the 20th here. The fascist, con again, it's all embracing, fa thus understood fascism is totalitarian and the fascist state, a synthesis and unit inclusive of all values, interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of the people. But if the underpinning of fascism is the primacy of the state, the backbone is the corporation, such as outlined on April 21, 1970, 1927, Charter of Labor. Again, this is Mussolini. The Italian nation is an organism having ends, a life and a means superior in power and duration to, the sing to single individuals or groups of individuals composing it. It is a moral, political, and economic unit which finds its integral realization in the fascist state. Work in all its forms, intellectual, technical, and manual, both organizing or executive, is a social duty on this score and only on this score is it protected by the state. The corporate state considers that private enterprise in the sphere of production is the most effective, the most effective and useful instrument in the interest of the state. In effect, Mussolini's corporate state was an attempt to resolve the conflict between capital and labor, labor but in favor of who? Capital, right. That will make you popular at a, at a Marxist rally. However, the corporate state government controls over corporations was a result, but without destroying private enterprise. In essence, the Italian dictatorship catered to capital by maintaining, in maintaining its control of power. By 1934, 22 corporations controlled a variety of industries, coal, steel, shipping, textiles, telephone, electricity. By 1940, Mussolini's dictatorship boasted a 20% stake in the private sector. Boy, do you think some of these tea partiers would like that? That's interesting. And higher than any government, a higher stake in the, in the, in the, in the, in, in the private sector than any government in Europe except for one, Stalinist Russia. Now, some might find that hard to believe, huh? It's not hard to believe because what Stalin did, interesting, Stalin understand, Stalin was no dumbbell. He understood what was going on here. He understood that in 1914 in, in Tsarist Russia, you know, when Russia goes to war with Germany in 1914, uh, Russia was not one of the leading industrial powers. You know, you mobilize six million men and four million have rifles. How's that going to work? Yeah, he's shaking his head. No, yeah, it's not going to work. And some of these guys have four, five, six rounds of ammunition. How's that going to work? And so that is so when Ivan gets shot, Stosh, who's following him, picks up the rifle and continues the attack. You know, Stalin's idea here is not on my watch. So when he displaces Trotsky, you know, in the 1926 Party Congress. He collectivizes the peasantry, and then he's going to start his program of forced industrialization. Stalin's not really a communist. He's indulging in state capitalism. And he's going to focus on heavy industries. What's Mussolini going to focus on before him? Heavy industry. Only we're going to see Russia is not like Italy. Go back to what I mentioned, I think I mentioned it in passing last week. At one point, Mussolini is the senior partner, Hitler is the junior partner. 
In fact, I think it was 1934, Hitler goes to a visit. He's wearing, he's wearing a double-breasted suit, a rumpled double-breasted suit. He looks a little like Peter Warren. <laughs> and who's standing there resplendent in his uniform? Mussolini, with that fez and a little tassel. And he has this military parade to impress Hitler. And it's, you know, they're going around a number of blocks here, and it's the same division. There was only one division in the Italian Italian army that was really fully equipped. Yeah, that's impressive, that is. You know. Again, what is that? Propaganda value? Looks good on the newsreels, though. Who on the newsreel can tell that this is the same outfit? March them around for two hours. Who can tell, right? Can't see that on newsreel selling the propaganda value of the movement. But Mr. Stalin will do the same thing as Mussolini did, only in spades here, in steroids. He's going to pinch the grain from the farmers and their livestock, so it's going to cause three or five million deaths in five years. Who cares? And he's going to sell this livestock and grain overseas for hard currency to do what? Build factories. And he's going to bring in American, British, and French engineers, and guess what? By 1941, Russia is one of the world's leading industrial powers. Now, that's not communism, folks. You know, it's, it's Joe Stalin Incorporated. It's what it is. And so Russia will be with the United States. You know, we'll, they will be behind us industrial production. But they're going to outproduce the Germans. And so you see this move toward industrialization. And the other thing you have to ask about fascism, too. You know, is this, it, considering that it comes out of what was known as World War I, of course, those who have heard me speak before know I do not go with World War I or World War II. There's only one war here. It starts in 1914, ends in 1945. It's only one war. Remember that thing, the Hundred Years' War? Remember that one? Go back to 13, uh, 1337 to 1457, the British and the French you know, fighting. That was actually numerous conflicts, four or five, and it's actually the 19th century where some of these historians say, well, let's call it the Hundred Years' War. No. Well, but that's basically what you saw in the 20th century, the Great War. And it really starts as a European civil war is how it really starts basically what it was, and it morphs into something beyond Europe. You know that. You saw that happen. But what is it? But what is fascism? You know, these ideas unleashed by the French Revolution, they don't, they don't, they're not orig they don't originate here, but basically the American and French revolutions, at least in part, were the ideas of the Age of Reason and Enlightenment put into action. But in France, it occurs in the belly of the beast, because now you're in the middle of all these monarchs. We're 3,000 miles away from Europe. That's a, that's a selling point for our revolution. That's a selling point for our revolution. The French, it's going to be tougher. But these ideas of liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, nationalism, parliamentarianism are unleashed. And so you see when Napoleon is finally defeated, those monarchs get together at the Congress of Vienna and try to put these ideas back into that bottle and cap it. And not just cap it, rivet that cap shut. Too late. The ideas are out. It's going to help undermine all these monarchs. However, what's also happening? The snowballing of the Industrial Revolution? Take a look at what happened in our, in our Civil War here. Some military historians call that really the first of the modern wars. Why did the North win besides population and money? What, industrialization? Yeah. <laughs> More resources? Yes. Go 80 years later, this is exactly what Stalin understands. Communism? What the heck is that? No. Oh. And so, you see here the North is going to win this war, but it helps change the face of conflict. Why the Industrial Revolution? The Germans understand this when Germany is finally formed. We will understand this coming down the road as a United Nation. 
But these ideas, it seems, and these ideas of liberalism, democracy, republicanism, you get into the what you call the First World War, 1914, and what happens? You know, this idea of levé en masse, conscripting entire populations and enti now entire economies for war. You can't have a democracy and do that. Centralized control, isn't that the best way to organize here? Yeah, it is. It is. And so this idea you have even in this country, uh, this, this, this idea of, in fact, in our country here, the, the, the Constitution of Bill of Rights, you know what was our blueprint for government? Are the rights of the individual are enshrined here. Well, what happens to even this country in 1917? The War Industries Board? Remember Bernard Baruch? Yeah. You can't, you're, you, maybe you own your own business, but you can't chart its course if you're on, if, you know, we're all now involved in this conflict. Production schedules, shipping schedules, uh, how, much you're, how much do we need and you're going to produce. What happened to the right of the individual to own his own company here? It's subsumed in the war. And so you need somebody like a Bernard Baruch to organize this. Yes? I was going to say, but, the, but these companies who were taken over, so to speak, they were well compensated for that by the government. Ah, now that's the other side of the coin. Well compensated by the government, yes. So what does that begin to put into place? A corporate state. And so you see that being built now. And who understands this later on? People like Mussolini, people like Mr. Hitler. In fact, John D. Rockefeller understood this in, in, the, in the late 19th century, when at one point he wanted to get together with uh, Carnegie and the Morgans, so on and so forth. And, they, and he says, you know, we're not going to make the money here with free market. Again, that's another thing that's under assault here. Free market, you know that thing we like to brag about, free market. And so, how, how can we really make money? Regulate the economy. And keep in mind, in this country back then, you didn't elect your senators, folks. You couldn't do that until 1913. And so, what is, what is Rockefeller thinking? Well, we have these senator, we have these, uh, the state legislators, they appointed the senators, have the state legislators appoint senators who will enact regular rules and regulations in Washington that will suit us. That's how you make money. <coughs> what is that? Corporate state. What you're saying. And so it's it. Of course, what's going to happen to Rockefeller? He's going to get busted, right? Yeah. Uh, but his, you know, the, the, the antitrust act, you know, they'll be broken down uh, Standard Oil into, what, 33, 34 companies. But the fact of the matter is, these ideas are resonating. And so what you see here in what you call the First World War is an assault on some of these ideas unleashed by the French Revolution. You know, it's being overtaken. The, the people are being overtaken by this mass industrialization and the growth of big government. That's what you're seeing here, too. Keep in mind, in this country, for the short time, we're in the First World War. Government here will grow 500%. We will spend $22 billion in the First World War. Washington will. We haven't, we haven't included the banks yet. The government will spend more money for the short time we are in this conflict than it spent from 1791 to 1914. How do you like that? You see what's happening here? It induces change. It's fascinating. And again, going back to, to Italy here, you know, Italy, <laughs> Italy was supposed to have been on the losing side. You know, the original, the original complement of the Triple Alliance was Germany, Austria-Hungary, which, which is not going to exist anymore after this conflict, Italy. Well, why didn't the, why didn't the Italians stay, stay with the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians? Because the British and the French promised them a better deal. That's why. Yeah, maybe you can get Trieste, Yumi. Oh, guess what? After the war, we're going to carve up Turkey. We'll give you a slice. Gee whiz, that's great. The Germans didn't promise us that. So they're not, they're not going to take part. So who will make up the third wheel on that, on that triple alliance? The Ottoman Empire. 
And so Italy won't get into the war until May 1915, but they're going to be disappointed. Italians will be disappointed, especially with Turkey. You know, Turkey, as you see, it was not supposed to exist. They had to fight for it. The West was going to Christianize the Middle East. You know, another crusade? Yeah, that went over well. And so Kamal Ataturk will lead the Turks in the 1919-1922 war for independence. Turkey exists today because of that. They'll throw out the British, the French, the Greeks, the Italians, and there'll be no Armenia and no Kurdistan. And who will help to a certain extent here? Lenin. Why? Because the aren't the, well, okay, we'll take the Armenians in the Caucasus, you can take the Armenians in, Ar in, uh, in, in Anatolia. What a deal. Done. And that's exactly what's going to happen here. That's exactly what's going to happen. And so when the fortunes of it the Italian people, when the war is over, when the economy is in the tank, who are they going to listen to? Someone who's going to promise them a better deal. Mr. Mussolini. You know, and Mussolini's support will come from the people from the back towns. You won't get as much support in the cities. Trade union workers, who are they going to go with? Socialists and communists. They did the same thing in Germany. They did the same thing in Germany. And some of the farmers in southern Italy, Mussolini, we don't want him. He will resonate with small businessmen, small shopkeepers, so on and so forth. People in smaller towns, but his popularity is going to grow. Especially when he can be seen by King Victor Emmanuel's government as a heh, bulwark against the communists. And so by 1921, fascist roughnecks are being used as paramilitaries by the Italian police and the Italian army that keep down the socialists and the communists. And in fact, even the Catholic Church finds him palatable at this point. So it is big business and they'll be and he'll be brought in. And so by October 1922, guess what happens here? Mussolini will help form a government. You remember that thing called the Long March with the fascists? Yeah, a lot of these black shirts marched quite a few miles to Rome. Uh, not Mussolini, he took the train most of the way. <laughs> like maybe two miles from Rome he got out. No. But the fact of the matter is, he will take power as the dictator. And he begins to form what's going to be known as, per that sheet, the corporate state. And so major corporations or corporations that are formed will run various industries. And what do you think happens to medium and small sized business? They're going to be adversely impacted. You know, his idea here is, you know, this sawdust Caesar is going to try to resurrect the glory that was once Rome's. Let's understand one thing about many Italian soldiers. They had had their fill. And so by World War II, this isn't going to be the German army here. And what do they what did they have here? They didn't have much. Germany. I mean, if you take a look at what and, and, and what's interesting here too is this idea is resonating in Germany. You know, Germany's even in worse condition. You know, they lost, you know, Italy is on the winning side and they have a political problem. Germany's on the losing side, and boy, do they have a political problem. The Weimar Republic, which I'll get into more next week is formed out of the ashes of a defeat. These people didn't, you know, Germans didn't fight and die for a, for a, rep, for a system of representative government. Not like, not like some colonists did here, 1775, 76 to 1781. Didn't colonists fight and die for a new, for a new government? Or, 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 or build a new country and throw the monarch out? Yeah, they did. That doesn't happen here. You see a, a, a so-called system of representative government being founded on the ashes of a monarchy, which really, for all intents and purposes, by 1916, Kaiser Wilhelm II no longer really runs Germany. The army does. The Hindenburg program. <coughs> it winds up where the general staff runs Germany. Paul von Hindenburg, Eric Ludendorff. And so what you saw develop here is the end of the monarchy in Germany 
and a modern military dictatorship for a short period of time. But you see the handwriting on the wall here. And the idea here is since the army is going to run the country, almost along the lines of how the Japanese army is going to have a primary position in the Japanese government. To the point where by the early 30s, you know they actually control the school system in Japan? Talk about a military state. In an hour a day, German, uh, Japanese children are drilling. I mean, by the time he's 13, a Japanese kid can take apart and put together a machine gun. You know where this country's going, and it's obvious here, right? Yeah. And so you see this sort of thing develop here on a different level, perhaps. But, you know, again, the, the, the military dictatorship, the army eats first. Guess who eats second? The people. Which is why in 1917, when Russia bails out of the war, the Germans want to fall, because the British blockade is biting. The German Navy can't turn back the British blockade by the Royal Navy. The English Channel's blocked off, the North Sea is blocked off. There's no trade with the world's greatest neutral, the United States. That's been cut off. Which is why Germany goes to unrestricted submarine warfare to help break that blockade or choke off the British. It doesn't work in the end. But Germans are starving. Was it 1916, 1917? Look back in history. The turn-up years. That's what they're called. And so the idea is to fashion Ukraine into a Teutonic delicatessen. Because that's where a lot of the wheat, you know, even today, Ukraine is the world's fifth largest grower of wheat. That's why people want it. And don't think Mr. Putin has forgotten that one. Don't think Archer Midland Daniels here has forgotten that one either. Ah, yeah. Battle between the corporate states. Fun to watch. But you see here the Germans trying to fashion this. Why? To offset the effects of the blockade. And sure, the, by brest by March 1918, the Russians have to swallow the, a loss of a lot of territory here. Remember one of the German negotiators, I can't recall his name right now, uh, was, was, was saying before he left to negotiate this, he said, he said the Russians have a choice uh, of, of, in, in this, you know, they don't have a choice. They're going to give up a lot of territory. And they're going to have to swallow this meat. It's just a matter of what kind of sauce they want to flavor it or somewhere along those lines. So Trotsky has to give up a lot of territory. Of course, the Russians are going to get it back anyway later on. But they don't know this at the time. But that doesn't work because America sends enough troops where the Germans are going to lose the war anyway. So the whole thing falls apart. But having said that, its representatives, you know, going back to when the Weimar Republic is formed, Social Democrats, people from the Catholic Center Party, uh, Socialists, whatever the case may be, they're blamed for losing the war, not the army. It's the big lie. The big lie. The army didn't lose the war, and they have a leg to stand on because did the Allies actually occupy Germany to the extent they're going to occupy Germany in 1945? <coughs> no, they won't. And the general staff is supposed to be dismembered, and Hans von Sieck changes the name of it to the troop office. But again, it undermines this system of representative government. Hitler. We can get into him. You know, he's not German, he was Austrian. You know, he doesn't become a German citizen until 1932. Convene, and boy, we go, and, and then what? Both sides of the argument here. Well, was Obama born here or not? No. But the fact of the matter is, Hitler was born in Austria. For now on M. In, rather, in Austria, just across the border from Bavaria, on April 20, 1889. And his father is a customs official who retires at age 58, wants young Adolf to do the same thing, and Adolf rebels. Likes being an artist, although he will not be accepted in the Vienna Art Academy, or Art Institute. And he'll label that being dominated by Jews, and that's why they don't appreciate my talent. You know where that's going. 
and he can't he doesn't want to go out for architecture because he doesn't have the proper credentials from school so he doesn't think he'll make it so he becomes a vagabond living on his father's pension passed on to him by his mother but that's going to run out too when she dies so he will leave Austria and go to Germany because he has an affinity for Germany you know he doesn't want to be a member of the Austro-Hungarian army too many Czechs, Slovaks, Slovenes and Jews he goes to Germany well, you know, there was a sizable number of German, uh, Jewish, people, Jewish men in the German army in World War I, many of whom considered Germany, you know, I'm fighting for my country and my Kaiser. Some of these guys considered themselves Ger uh, German soldiers before Jew being Jewish. Well, what happened by the 1930s? But by all accounts, he's a fairly brave soldier. He's a runner. That's not an easy job in the trenches. And he will, he will get an Iron Cross second class, but he will be blinded at the end of the war, the last three weeks of the war. Uh, gas. <coughs> now, when he, I know I was giving this talk one time, and some place said, yeah, somebody piped up from the audience and says, yeah, it's too bad he got his sight back. But he will get his sight back, and by that time, the war is over. But Hitler will stay in the army. What else is he going to do? He stays in the army, and he's an educate, education political officer. Translation is, he go, he's assigned by the army to go view different political parties. There's an effervescence of parties here in Germany. Right, left, <coughs> center, whatever. And, in, and, in, and he goes to a party meeting in October 1919, the German Workers' Party, uh, chaired by a man by the name of... Uh, Anton Drexler, the machinist. It's very much to the right, anti-Marxist, pro-militarist, anti-Jewish, and he goes there. And you know, he listens to this, you know, the talks going on, and he doesn't think the party's going anywhere, and he gets ready to leave. And as he's exiting the meeting, some professor gets up and begins to harangue the meeting. He was probably from the left. And this galvanizes Hitler. Runs back to the, he runs back in and he mounts the rostrum and gives this speech. Ah, now he's found a voice here. Now he's found a voice. He's asked, you know, very nationalistic this 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 so-called speech. He's asked to be a party member. Well, you know, you know, some of these party meetings, they stuff your hands full of literature, right? Doesn't make a decision, leaves the meeting. Well, you know, he's assured of a job with the army. Not so by being a member of the Nazi party. Or the German, it's not Nazi, a German workers party. And so he decides, having done some soul searching, that maybe, just maybe, you know, the party doesn't have much of a following yet, but if I take control of this party, I can use this as an instrument. And that's exactly what he is going to do. And history will be made from here. He will actually be one of those who will change, in fact, it's, it's, he's given the credit for it, but he will be one of those that will change the name from the German Workers' Party to the National Socialist German Workers' Party to help broaden the base here. Not that Hitler believes in socialism. There are two words for people like him and Himmler and so on and so forth that are important. German nationalist. Those are the words that are important. Workers, socialism, nah. There is also another gentleman here that needs to be highlighted. And in the last four pages of that handout, in fact, there is a photo of this gentleman in that handout. The last four pages are come out of a short book he wrote on revolution. The man's name is Ernst Röhm. You know, whenever we talk about the Nazis, it's usually who? Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, Gore, Fatso, Goring, people like this, right? What about Ernst Röhm? Nobody talks about him. Nobody, half the people don't know who he was. And yet he was instrumental in Hitler's rise to power. He looks like Oliver Hardy with a scar on his face. He's a bit pompous.
ponderous like Oliver Hardy, well, Oliver Norval Hardy? That's where the similarity ends, folks. That's where the similarity ends. He was born in Munich in 1887, November 28, 1887. Didn't come from a military family, but he joins the military, the Bavarian outfit, in 1906. Will become a second lieutenant in 1907. He will fight in the First World War. As a, he starts the war as a second lieutenant, he will be shot in the face in 1914. He will recover from this close brush with death and be put back into the trenches. He will be shot in the chest during the Battle of Verdun. Nearly dies again and recovers. He will go from being a second lieutenant to a first lieutenant, being promoted to captain and put on staff. He'll be in France and Romania. He gets around. He will contract the Spanish flu in October of 1918, almost dies again and survives. And Hitler will meet him in the German Workers' Party. He is also a member of one of the Fry Corps. Going back into what I mentioned last week about the Fry Corps, these guys who are unemployed soldiers, freebooters, guys out of work, whatever the case may be. And you know, they're, they're sprouting up all over Germany here, the Fry Corps. All over Germany, of a right-wing pers persuasion for the most part, uh, very militaristic. Some support the monarchy, some support other parties of the left, like the Stahlhelm or Steel Helmet. Mr. Rum is in a Bavarian Fry Corps on the on the eastern border, so he's fighting people like Czechs and so on and so forth. He's no stranger to fighting. Uh, he will become, for want of a better description, a rampant homosexual by the time he's 25. He will be using SA, he will be, in, he'll, he'll get into the SA. He will later be using SA officers, or an SA officer in particular, to scout up boys or men for him. Partners. No. But there's one thing about him. He's an excellent organizer and tough as they come. You know, this stuff about some people, that outlook some people have, that homosexuals are weak and... Uh, ha. Uh, let me tell you something. If you were going into a dark alley and you were apprehensive about doing that, uh, you, Mr. Rome, there is nobody better with a, a broken bottle, a club, a chain, a pipe, or a gun, or a knife than Ernst Rum. Oh. <laughs> He will be a lot, and him and him and he and Hitler will form quite a coalition here to the point where Rum is allowed to call him Adolf or even Addy. Hitler's not stupid. Guy's a good organizer, and he's tough. Will man the barricades. Won't break. I mean, anyone that's been shot in the face or shot in the chest survived Spanish flu. That's not a weak character, folks. Even if he is a homosexual, who cares? It works. And so you see this amalgamation being formed here. You see this amalgamation being formed. And again, at the same time, you're getting into 1919, 1920. You know, the SA is going to be formed here. And Rome helps organize this. These street brawlers that protect the Nazi meetings or the beer hall gatherings from, from, the, from the communists in particular. Later known as the Rock Kampferbund or their version of the SA, the Sturm Abteilung or Stormtroopers. And some of these stormtroopers and later members of Hitler's SS come, out, come from where? The Fry Corps. They got to eat, you know. I mean, it's the same sort of thing you saw in Iraq, those so called awakening groups, ex Saddam soldiers coming out of the Baptist Party. Hey, these guys got to eat. We didn't help the economy that much by producing an unemployment rate of 40 or 50 percent. So what are these guys going to do? They're going to pick up an AK, make money by shooting at you. Shouldn't be hard to figure that one out. Well, that's more or less what's going on here. That's more or less what's going on here. 
And so you see here, under, 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 underneath the Weimar Republic, this idea of these right-wing groups, the left, and the, and the Weimar Republic is not really a stable form of representative government. The idea of reparations. You know, here you see, by April 1921, the Allies finally settle on reparations. $33 billion in a country that its, its economy isn't working too well, plus the Belgian war debt. You know, at this point, it's about this point where the German mark, uh, it takes approximately four marks to equal a buck at this point. And yet, the German economy is going to falter. It's going to fall to the point where the Germans cannot afford to pay the debt. And they ask for a rescheduling. Some even want a cancellation of the debt. And the French will occupy the Ruhr, one of the industrial heartlands of Nazi Germany, in January of 1923. Now the mark, where at one point it was four marks to the dollar, 400 marks to the dollar, and by the late summer, by August, it's 18,000 marks to the dollar. At one point it will go to four billion marks to the dollar. You remember those photos of people with the wheelbarrows full, piled full of marks going to get a loaf of bread? Is this conducive to revolutionary activity? You know it. Gustav Stressman, chancellor, one time foreign minister, you know, it's not fashionable to go back and pay the reparations. He wants to pay the reparations. Now keep in mind what you're seeing here, an inflated currency, let's break it down a little bit. You know, the German government is going to pay these reparations with an inflated currency. German businessmen will pay their debts with an inflated currency. Does that work for them? Yeah, of course it does. Who doesn't an inflated currency work for? The common everyday Joe, what happens to his, his and her savings? White, yeah, wiped out. <coughs> and so now it becomes even more radical in Germany. Hitler, you know, what happens in Bavaria here is that this leads to the Munich Putsch. In the late summer, early fall, 1923, Bavaria wants to secede from Germany. You know, like some people in Texas want to leave the country. I remember mentioning that one time when someone again piped up, let him go. <laughs> no. And so Gustav von Kahr, the high commissioner, becomes a virtual dictator in Bavaria. Hans von Seisser, chief of the Bavarian police, supports him. As does Otto von Lassau, General Otto von Lassau, who is in command of German army troops in Bavaria. The three of them. That's not conducive to a German state, going back to what you were mentioning before, when we, before we started here, about these German cities and, and principalities being having their own autonomous characteristic. Well, you're seeing it here. Hitler. You know, Hitler, Hitler's not ready, but now he's being pushed by some of the Nazi supporters. We have to make a move now. Hitler would rather take the whole country. But what happens if what Bavaria is doing begins to spread into Saxony, Thuringia, Schleswig Holstein, what happens here? A fractured Germany again, like in the Middle Ages? He wants the whole ball of wax here, not just part of a loaf. He's virtually got, got to move now. Not that he wants to, but he has to. But he can't move unless he's sure that von Kahr, von Seisser, von Lassau, or in one place together where he can take them all in one felt swoop. And that will be on November 8, 1923, at the Burgerbrau Keller. The three of them there, von, von Karr, von Lassau, von, von Seisser, 
are actually addressing a group of German businessmen. Some of them are businessmen, but a group of German men. And the Nazis have this organized. Uh, Ernst Röhm, Mr. Röhm is back again, with a detachment will, in Munich, this is going to be in Munich, by the way, he will take control of the army headquarters building in Munich. He will succeed in doing this. And as usual, Mr. Rome's fashion will maintain a hold of the building. Hitler, Hermann Goering, will lead a detachment of some, and the estimates range anywhere from 300 to 500 armed SA men, you know, the, the bear hall roughnecks, that surround the Burger Brow Keller. Hitler has a pistol. He'll walk, he'll not walk in, he will run in. And here, von Karr, von Lassau, and von, and von Seisser on the stage addressing these, these men. And he runs up. All of a sudden, Goering follows. And you know some of these armed SA men are beginning to surround the audience here. They're all armed with rifles. And Hitler announces that the national revolution has begun. Well, no, it hasn't. But that's what he's announcing here. And he asks that people to join him. Well, they all sit there. The heck is this nut? Although now some of the audience is getting apprehensive because of those armed SA men surrounding the, the audience. That'll make you a little apprehensive. Von Karr, Von Lasso, and Von Seisser won't even answer. So Hitler orders them into a back room. He tries to persuade them to go with him. They don't, no. Hitler finally says, I have four bullets in my pistol, one for each of you and one for me. No. Well, someone had the good sense to roust Erich von Ludendorff because Hitler and Ludendorff had been striking up a, a relationship here. Of course, Ludend you know, the Nazis want to use Ludendorff because he's a, still a hero, considered a hero. Although Mr. Ludendorff doesn't like the idea he's been rousted out of bed. But he goes anyway. By the time he shows up, Hitler is getting nowhere with von Karr, von, von Lassau, and von Seisser. So what does he do? He leaves the room where he has them closeted up, runs onto the stage. This is a whim here. And he's waving his pistol. Von Seisser, von Karr, and von Lassau have agreed to join me. We're going to national revolution. All of a sudden, now people are cheering. Wow, we're all on the same page here. The SA men, the, the men in the audience are all cheering. Who enters now? Ludendorff. Interesting here. We're all in this together. And then finally it's von, uh, Ludendorff, Hitler, von Karr, von Lassau, von Seisser on the stage. Everyone's cheering. Yeah, gee, you feel the love in the room here. <coughs> Hitler feels now he can leave the premises to go see if everything else is running along all right. Nobody has taken uh, the communications building. The utilities still aren't controlled yet. And so as soon as he leaves, what do von Seisser, von Lasso, and von Karr do? They convince Ludendorff that they can leave, and they are going to contact Berlin. Guess what? They're going to sell Hitler down the river. And von Siecht, Hans von Siecht, General von Siecht, will send the troops. And they will arrive and back up the German police in Munich. Now Hitler now is in a quandary. Now what do I do? What do I do now? Ludendorff convinces him, why don't we organize and march on the army, 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 uh, army building where, where uh, room is closeted up. He's still holding the army building, by the way. So Hitler with nothing to lose? OK, we'll do that. They all line up. They begin to march on the army command center. And in front of the Army Command Center, German police. They're all armed and waiting. You know, Ludendorff's idea is, well, I'm in the front row. They're not going to shoot. It's me. <laughs> Who's going to shoot me? Nobody, at, and, and next to him is Hitler. He's in arm in arm with another Nazi follower. And nobody knows to this day, or, or you know, they, they can't determine who fired a shot. All of a sudden, shots are fired. The German police fires volley after volley. 16 Nazis are killed, a number, of a number are wounded. And in fact, Mein Kampf is dedicated to the 16 dead. Hitler, by the way, the man next to him had been shot, and arm in arm, he pulls Hitler to the pavement, dislocating Hitler's arm. 
Hermann Göring a shot here, although he later escapes. And he will become, you know, to do, deal with the pain of being shot, will become a morphine addict. And Hitler will scamper into a car and escape. Ludendorff, he just keeps marching across the roadway right into the arms of the police, and he's not even touched. Rooms group would be taken prisoner, and then the so-called putsch is over. Hitler will go on trial. Now, you would have thought, right? That's treason, isn't it? Isn't that what you would call this, treason? Yeah, it sounds like it. Keep in mind the condition in Germany at this point. The extreme right, under support of the bankers, big business, monarchists who, still, who are still around, many of the German government functionaries are from the right, which helps to undermine the Weimar Republic. Hitler will be given an opportunity in the courtroom again to harangue the courtroom. The sentence could have been five years. He gets nine months in Landsberg prison. Rudolf Hess will be with him. And it is here he's going to dictate and write, and Hess will help him. Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf, right. My struggle, my battle, and it's here. This is, I guess, uh, I don't know if I want to make this comparison, but maybe this is like Stu Leonard's up in Danbury prison here. <laughs> This isn't like going to breaking rocks at Tehachapi. And so it's here that he realizes that I don't want to take power forcibly. I want to be able to do it legally. And the book will be written. Uh, Mr. Rum really won't serve any real jail time. He will later leave Germany and go to, go to Bolivia to help train the Bolivian police and the Bolivian army. Hitler will call him back, but I'll get to that later. The last, the last talk. Hitler's, I need you. Be back right away. And so what you saw with Mr. Hitler here is, yes, I am not going to take power by force. I want to take power legally. Keep in mind what else happened in 1924. You know, to bring Germany out of the doldrums, the Dawes plan from the United States. We will bolster the German economy. The American dollar will help to float Germany. Of course, there's a selfish reason for this. You know, the bankers here are owed 10, 12 billion dollars. Obviously, if you loan money, you want it back. That's what you're in business for, right? There's really nothing wrong with that. You want the money back. And so, the, especially the British and the French, they owe us a lot of money. And so, if the Germans can't pay the reparations, how do we expect to get paid back? So, we're going we're to help float the German economy here. You know, we're going we're gonna to devote between 1924 and 1932 <coughs> some $7 billion? That's a lot of dough. But the German, you know, the reparation schedule begins again. And so the Germans pay back the Belgians, the French, and the Dutch. And guess what happens after that? They will pay us back, so the dollar is going to do this. It's a revolving door. And so the country, Germany, will begin to right itself, at least for now. Germans are going back to work, German children going to school, and it seems like this system of representative government is now being put on some sort of sound footing. But it's not, because Hans von Siecht, you know, Frederick Ebert, back even in 1919, General Gruner told him, Regardless of what kind of government we have, the German army is going to rebuild. And Hans von Siecht will carry this forward. And it didn't make any difference to the army who's in power. We are going to rebuild the German military. That's coming, regardless of who's in power. 
and it seems in this case the German people have no say in this. Keep in mind now, the German general staff is, an institu is a veritable institution. Hard to get rid of institutions. Hard to get rid of institutions. And so Mr. Hitler has learned a valuable lesson here. A valuable lesson. And history will go on from there. And you know, it's interesting here what he says about organizing. <coughs> Mr. Hitler is interesting when he wrote this book, Mein Kampf, talking about the pan, uh, pan uh, German movement and talking about how nationality is important. In other words, getting down to the factor of race here. If, by the instrument of governmental power, a nationality is led toward its destruction, then rebellion is not only a right, but every member of such a people, it is his duty to revolt against that government. Does that sound familiar? It should. But when the long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them to absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Declaration of Independence. That's Thomas Jefferson. Yet, yeah, Hitler is saying almost the same sort of thing, but with regards to nationality. Now that's fascinating, isn't it? Yes. Hitler had a lot of baggage that he brought from Austria. And I would dare say that many... He wasn't carrying as much baggage as Fatso Goering was. Now, yes, but many of his cohorts all came with baggage. That had well, yeah, they did. Race. Does Hitler in Mein Kampf go into his philosophy of the Aryan states and oh, yeah. who he considered was were the true Germans. Because after a while, propaganda and racial manipulation really took over the thinking of the German state. Like you were saying in World War I, many Jews fought in, in the war. They regarded themselves as German first, Jewish second. Some of them did, yeah. And by the time World War II was upon us, they, many people still had that philosophy, <coughs> that belief, and oh, they're not going to do anything to us. Well, you need a scapegoat. Right. You and need a scapegoat. But keep in mind, Hitler was Austrian, not German. But in his book, does he, is there any beginning of a scenario in Mein Kampf about his concept of race? In general, in general, it should not be forgotten that the highest aim of human existence is not the preservation of the state, let alone a government, but the preservation of the species. And if the species itself is in danger of being oppressed or utterly eliminated, the question of legality is reduced to a sub subordinate role. Then, even if the methods of the ruling power are alleged to be legal a thousand times over, nonetheless, the oppressed people's instinct of self-preservation remains the loftiest justification of their struggle with every weapon. Only through recognition of this principle have wars of liberation against internal and external enslavement of nations on this earth come down to us in such majest majestic historical examples. <coughs> Human law cancels out state law. And if a people, it, now there's, here's one, and if a people is defeated in its struggle for human rights, this merely means that it has been found too light in the scale of destiny for the happiness of survival on this earth. For when a people is not willing or able to fight for its existence, now here we get into this thing about God, providence in, its exter in eternal justice has decreed that people's end. The world is not for cowardly peoples. And then when you add to this, 
add to this the matter of the Nazi party, even, when the, even then I always come out in favor of taking a position in important questions of principle against all public opinion when it, is, when it assumed a false <laughs> attitude, disregarding all considerations of popularity, hatred, or struggle. The NSDAP, National Socialist German Workers' Party, should not become a constable of public opinion, but must dominate it. It must not become a servant of the masses, but their master. So now you take control of the government and lead it with regards to what? Racial supremacy? Was he religious? He was a Catholic. Of course, that didn't last. That's like Stalin. His, his mother sent him to a seminary as a teenager. That made him real happy. And you know, he'll call his mother a bitch and not see her for 40 years. Then he'll become radicalized, radi he will join radical politics, the Bolsheviks, and he'll become a bank robber for the Bolshevik party. And so, yeah, it's interesting, and it's interesting, all these, all these guys are coming up at the same time. Stalin, Lenin, uh, Hitler, Mussolini, Ernst Röhm, people like this, are all coming up at the same time here. Boy, what a class that is. So it's fascinating what, you see, what you're seeing develop here. Anybody have any questions or comments? Oh, yes. Why, why didn't the Allies establish a contented governorship? Like a, yeah. I mean, I mean, no, I mean normally a, a defeated power for a period of time, a military governor like our man MacArthur, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, they did, they, you're right, they did not do that. Um, there was talk about doing that. Uh, but they negated in doing that. One of the reasons is they wanted to help develop a Germany in this regard uh, against Bolshevik. Bolshevik Russia had a, had a point here. They didn't want to occupy Germany because they didn't want to be involved in a potential guerrilla war. They're, you know, they're already, the Allies are already fighting the Turks. They're already fighting the Iraqis. They're already fighting, they're already fighting the Syrians. Uh, they're all, and they're also, the British are fighting in Afghanistan at this point. <laughs> 19, 19, 19, 20. How much can you be spread out? Right, so they, they really couldn't afford a standing army. Well, no, I mean, the, the yeah, people, they, yeah, I mean, the British have 965,000 dead in four years. The French have 1,565,000 dead in four years. And their families want them home. But no, we got our empires to take care of. That's more important than Germany. And so in, in, in the end, the question you're asking here, if they had done perhaps what you suggest, then maybe, just maybe, that the Allies could have really taken a firm stand and supported representative government in Germany. So when they don't support representative government, where do you think this country's gonna go? So how committed were they? And again, this come back to the United States. Again, I mentioned this guy, Edward Bernays. No, he's not the inventor of the sauce. <laughs> that man that will be in that the, 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 the Committee of Public Information. He helps to sell the war he helps to sell the war here to the masses as a war for democracy. Well if they were really into salvaging democracy, they would have they would have supported representative government in Germany to prevent another war? That doesn't happen. And so yeah, in 1945, what's gonna happen to Germany in 1945? Divided Soviet, French, British American zones. Italy will be occupied. Japan will be occupied, as you said before. MacArthur will be the military governor. And so, yeah, they don't make the same mistake they made in 1918, 1919. But that's too late now. It's too late. So we're going to have to do this again after 1939. Yes? A question about reparations. How did that really work? Was it a uh, seizure of physical assets? That Some of it was, especially with the French in 1923. In fact, the French are going to abscond with tax receipts, fees, duties, and so on and so forth because the Germans can't pay. And so uh, the, some of the German workers will begin a silent, uh, silent revolt here, or if you want, you want to call it that. Some of them won't go to work. Some of them will work at a half pace. Some of them will pay their taxes, so on and so forth. And, 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 and the Belgians also join the French in occupying the Ruhr. In fact, some of what the French are going to do is, and uh, this really hits the Germans, they're also going to bring in troops from, you know, black troops from their uh, colonies. Yeah, that worked real well. 
That's almost like what the Union Army did to the South. After 1865, having black troops in the Union Army occupying the South, yeah, that went over well. So, it's, yeah, it's interesting, but just see, it's fascinating. And so does this increase, uh, does, this inc does this inflame the right? Yes. You know, and, you know, people like, in fact, if you look at that, look at that handout, the last two pages are the territories lost by Germany after the war. That, too, inflames nationalism. And we're going to get this territory back. You know. And again, going back, again, I made a comparison the other day with this, uh, doing the same talk, that one of the reasons you have another war, one of the most popular reasons is that one side lost territory. Well, what happened, and the, and the historical example here is the War of 1812. You know, at one point, the British, the British wanted to take a large portion of New York State and return it back to Canada. They also wanted to kick us out of the Ohio River Valley and give it to the, give it to the Indians, give it back to the Indians. And John Adams is saying, I'll fight this war forever as opposed to give the British one acre. And so when they can't take, when their when they're, when they're invasion of the United States, to take Plattsburgh fails, when they, after they burn Washington, D.C., they're stopped at Baltimore, that offensive comes to an end. Lord Wellington's telling the negotiators at Ghent, you might as well make a deal because we can't take the Great Lakes. If we can't get the Great Lakes, then we can't, we can't defeat the United States. So nobody lost territory. And so after the Treaty of Ghent is signed, you know, John Quincy Adams, John Adams' son, will say, Gee, I hope this is the last peace treaty we ever have to sign with the British. That's 203 years ago. Actually, 213 years ago. So, no, 203 years ago. So, was John Quincy Adams right? Yeah, we haven't had a war with Britain in 203 years. Give us another week. Give us another week. <laughs> but nobody lost territory. We didn't take Canada, but we keep New York and the Ohio River Valley. And then what's interesting after the after the after the effect after this after you know the treaty again in 1815 we sit down with the British peacefully to discuss fishing rights off Newfoundland. And then two years after that, the Rush Bagot Treaty, the British were going to remilitarize Lake Champlain, put warships on it. Whoa, let's sit down and discuss this. So the United States and Britain come to a peaceful agreement. We'll each put one 100-ton warship on Lake Champlain, one such warship on Lake Ontario, and two ships on the other Great Lakes. They agree to this. They agree to this. 1818, they agreed peacefully through a joint occupation of the Oregon Territory, but there's no war. That's not what happens in 1918. I mean, the Germans are not only, yeah, the Germans are not only uh, not even uh, not occupied, they're, they're fighting amongst themselves. These Fry Corps are fighting the Poles on their eastern border because the vengeful Poles want to take territory. The Czechs want territory. Even some of the French on the western side, there's, there's skirmishes going on here. And then the Poles invade Russia to take part of Ukraine. There's fighting going on all over the place. The war really didn't stop the fighting. It just morphed into something else here. Yes? Taking a look at your hand the first sentence, there are elements of our way of life in that first sentence. However, when you go to the second sentence, the fact that you're on the idea of trying to see the state Mm -hmm. Obedience and discipline. Are we on the slippery slope from the, the rights of the individual in sentence one to what one can find on the horizon in sentence two and three as far as our country is concerned? Well, you know, after the Constitutional Convention, uh, Franklin was asked. She's asking about, are we on that slippery slope going the same route here? Uh, Franklin was asked at the, the end of the Constitutional Convention by a woman, well, what kinds of government did you give us? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. And so, uh, you know, your Constitution and your Bill of Rights were your blueprint for government. Your Constitution is actually a blueprint. Bill of Rights is your protection against the infringement of government. That's what this was. It was formed as a republic. Yet you have to ask the question now. 
Uh, do presidents go before Congress and ask for a declaration of war like they used to? Does Congress really can have power of the purse anymore? Uh, what happened to the What happened to the First Amendment with freedom of the press? Not after what Bill Clinton did to the press in the 1990s. Now you have six owners of media. Uh, what happened to the well-regulated militia that was originally intended in, in the, uh, the Second Amendment and the 1792 Militia Act? Well, you don't have a well-regulated militia anymore. The National Guard's a bona fide reserve of the United States Army. Uh, what happened to the Fourth Amendment in proper searches or seizures? Well, what's the NSA doing with your phone records and your emails? Uh, how about the Eighth Amendment, the uh, cruel and unusual punishment? What did Bush and Cheney do in Iraq? And then uh, Trump wanted to do the same thing. That that's violates cruel and unusual punishment. And so you see a gradual erosion here of that blueprint for government to the point that, I don't know, you say. People seem to take a look at the antitrust laws against monopolies. That slowed the rise of the monopolies. Because that's what happened to the we don't have clues really happening. Well, no, you don't. But, I mean, you know, when you get back into this thing called fascism, you, 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 if you take a look at what happened in Germany, Italy, and take a look at Japan, that's fascism. Primacy of the Japanese race. Uh, this idea, in fact, the Japanese propagated this, this thing called Haku Ichu, bringing the four, eight corners of the world under one roof, a Japanese roof. This thing they were throwing out, Asia for Asians, let's throw out the white Christian colonial powers, now we're back to race. Let's throw out the white Christian colonial powers, Asia for Asians, yeah, run by the Japanese. And so these people are just going to be turning, you know, just going to be trading one overseer for another. It's like Stalin when the war was over. There's a book called Conversations with Stalin written by Mia von Gias. It's an interesting book. Gias was with Tito in Yugoslavia. He'll, he'll, he'll wind up in jail. But he's a prolific writer and, a, and quite a political theorist himself. But he remembers conversations they had with Stalin in 1945, him and Tito. You know, the, Ger you know, the Germans were utterly defeated in 45. but you know what Stalin says? Stalin says the Germans are a dynamic, uh, organized, and very intelligent people, and they'll be back in 12, 15 years. And he says, so all of us slobs should stick together. Well, what are the Japanese saying? Asia for Asians, let's throw the white Christian colonial powers out of here. What difference is it? There is no difference here. Go to the Middle East. You know, at the same time, fascism's being formed, Nazism follows, Stalin's going to be going through this, uh, this state capitalism. Uh, it, go to the Middle East. You know, again, these ideas from the French Revolution. The idea of Bath. The Bath Party, what's later going to be the Bath Party? You know, you got uh, you, uh, you got uh, Michael Aflag, that Syrian theorist. You have uh, uh, Constantine Zurich, another one, and they consult Marxism, socialism, and fascism, and put together this thing known as Bathism. Pan Arab, we're all in this together. Well, what's the difference between what the, the Japanese government is espousing and what the fascists want and what the Nazis want? There's no, go back to my conference, it's virtually the same sort of thing. This Pan Arabist, we're all in this together. And the Bath Party had, had, a, had, a, had a motto three things liberty, unity, socialism. Socialism, not for everyone else, but just for Arabs. How exclusive. Uh, the, uh, unity. We're all Arabs. This pan-Arabic family. Liberty. Well, I'll go back to what this thing, you know, fascism. The liberty individual, that's subsumed in the state. And so, you know, when you were growing up, what, what was liberty to you? Freedom of the individual? Well, go back to our Constitution. The rights of the individual. What do you see here with the fast party? Liberty. Not for the individual. Liberty from colonial overseers, specifically the West. That's not the individual. That run, individual, that runs at odds with the pan-Arabic unity. That's fascistic. And yet, somebody like a Saddam will localize that and use that to take control of Iraq or help take control of Iraq and he'll be the beneficiary when Hassan Bakir decides to hang it up. And so, you know, Stalin's going to do the same thing, nationalized communism. You know, so, yeah, the idea is primacy of the state. Now, it can become either authoritarian. Mussolini said it's totalitarian because he's trying to push the idea that the state encompasses everything. 
but it could be authoritarian or totalitarian. But it's fascinating what you saw develop here coming out of the First World War. Interesting. Interesting. You're welcome. Next week I'm going to do the Weimar Republic. So we'll see what we'll see where that goes. And then the week after that, the week after that will be the night of the long knives. So have a good evening. Take care.